This is Global Tennessee, news analysis and commentary from the Tennessee World Affairs Council in Nashville. Global Tennessee is produced in association with the Center for International Business at Belmont University and the International Business Council of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. The World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit educational association, and the views expressed on Global Tennessee are those of the participants. Welcome to the June 16th edition of Global Dialogue, the International Affairs Speakers Program of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. I'm Patrick Ryan. This evening, I'm honored to welcome Nancy Lindborg, President of the United States Institute of Peace. She's a great friend of the Tennessee World Affairs Council and the network of World Affairs Councils of America. USIP has hosted the national championship of the Academic WorldQuest program, and their participation has been especially inspiring to the young people who enjoyed that experience. We were fortunate to welcome Ms. Lindborg to Nashville in 2017 as part of our Distinguished Visiting Speakers program. On that visit, she and USIP's Director of Public Education, Ann Louise Colgan, set a high bar for the speakers we host. We usually work to present our guest speakers to as many people in the community as we can squeeze into a visit, but this one was a marathon. Ms. Lindborg started on a Monday morning at Martin Luther King Jr. Magnet High School talking with scores of students. She clearly connected with them with dozens lining up to chat after her presentation. From there, we were off to the Wild Horse Saloon downtown where she talked about peace building to several hundred Rotarians from the Nashville Club. Her message was America's critical role pursuing a world without conflict. The next stop was another high school assembly, this time at Hume Fogg Academic, another session where students were in rapt attention to the message of how USIP works with partners around the world for peace and stability. Before the afternoon was over, Ms. Lindborg was at the offices of the Tennessean for a conversation with opinion engagement editor and head of the paper's editorial board, David Posits. From there, it was on to a packed house at the World Affairs Council's Global Town Hall at Belmont University. The day still wasn't done. She was off to a dinner event with community leaders, talking with them about USIP's challenge of peace building around the globe. The next morning, it was up early to meet the National Chamber of Commerce's International Business Committee and a conversation about the importance of bringing stability and security to places embroiled in the conflict, in conflict. From there, on to Lipscomb University for an appointment as guest lecturer to an audience full of attentive students. All that in just over 24 hours. TNWAC record of events attended and numbers of people in the community reached with her important message. I invite you to read Nancy Lindborg's complete biography on the USIP.org website. It's an incredible story of service and leadership, but let me tell you that Nancy Lindborg has served as the president and CEO of the US Institute of Peace since February, 2015. USIP was created by Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan, federally funded institute to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world. Prior to joining USIP, she served as the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at the U.S. Agency for International Development. From 2010 through 2014, Ms. Lindborg directed the efforts of more than 600 team members in nine offices focused on crisis prevention, response, recovery, and transition. Ms. Lindborg has spent most of her career working on issues of transition, democracy, and civil society, conflict, and humanitarian response. Prior to joining USAID, she was president of Mercy Corps, where she spent 14 years helping grow it into a globally respected organization known for innovative programs and the most challenging environments. Nancy Lindborg, welcome back to Nashville on this virtual visit. Pat, it is really a pleasure to be here. And, you know, in my memory, I was there for a week, and now I know why. <laughs> it really kept me busy. <laughs> well, this visit uh, hopefully will be a less grueling schedule. Uh, we, we wish you were here, but uh, we, we thank you for joining us uh, via the webinar. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, this, uh, this is a, a conversation. We're not uh, uh, doing a, a formal presentation, but let, let me just uh, start by asking you uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, how did you end up working on these international uh, issues and why uh, peace and conflict uh, particularly? Well, uh, you, you gave a good overview of, of the last 30 years of, of what I've focused on and worked on. And the one thing I would really underscore is, you know, I spent a lot of years working 
in providing immediate relief. And it's a critically important and urgent thing to do. And at some point you start asking yourself, is there a way to get ahead of these crises? Is there something that we can do uh, to stop these terrible crises from happening that create this enormous need? And I think that's where a lot of the humanitarian field has gone, whether it's preparing people in the event of natural disasters or looking at ways uh, to create a, a stronger fabric of society that keeps a community from falling into violent conflict. Conflict will always happen, but if you can manage it without it becoming so violent that it tears everything apart, you, you could end up in, an, in a transformative place. But if, it, if you don't have those systems, if you don't have that citizen government fabric, then things fall apart and then you have the need for more humanitarian assistance. So it was a wonderful evolution to be able to come to the U.S. Institute of Peace where that's exactly what we think about and work with partners around the world on. Well, your, your experiences, uh, uh, and I wasn't uh, exaggerating in the attention the students showed to the comments and, and remarks you made in, in your visits to uh, Martin Luther King and, and Yoon Fogg. They were, they were very much inspired uh, by the work that uh, you've done. Uh, tell us a, a bit more about the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, now, I, I believe in its 35th year, uh, I, I kind of described uh, the purpose of it, but uh, can you give us more detail about uh, why it was created? What, what is uh, the Institute's approach to uh, its mission and and uh, what do you think makes it most relevant? Yeah, so as you indicated, um, U.S. Institute of Peace was, was founded um, by the U.S. Congress, but it was really a wonderful quintessential act of American creation in that um, in Congress there were veterans who had served in World War II and who came back to serve as elected officials but seized with this idea that we as a country needed more tools for preventing and resolving violent conflict. Um, at the same time, there was a real grassroots movement with people calling for, you know, an Academy of Peace or a Department of Peace, and they, they met. Um, and it resulted in the formation of a bill that passed and, and created the U.S. Institute of Peace and was signed into law um, by President Reagan in 1984. And it is rigorously nonpartisan. Uh, we work around the world with partners and we work both with the governments working to build peace from the top down, as well as with civil society leaders, faith leaders, women, youth, to build peace from the bottom up. And our conviction and experience is that that's what it takes. You really need to work in both directions at high policy, but also where so much happens on the ground. Um, in terms of reaching across divides, resolving differences, creating the foundation for a more sustained peace. Um, and it it's, it, I think, uh, more important than ever, especially as we go into an even more rocky period with the advent of COVID now starting to really creep into the more, the more fragile countries around the world. You, uh, you've traveled quite a lot in, in the last five years at uh, USIP and in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the green room here, you mentioned that this is the longest time you've spent in any one, uh, any one time zone. Um, I, think, I think we're all feeling a little ready yeah. to, to get out and, and go somewhere. But uh, tell, tell us, what, what was the, uh, the last trip or the last couple of trips you took uh, before the pandemic and, and what sorts of things were you doing and what stood out uh, in your mind? Well, the last trip I took was in February to Pakistan, where COVID was already starting to kind of lap at the edges of the world. But, you know, it still felt really far away, um, remarkably, given how quickly it came up afterwards. But uh, we uh, have an office there. So I have USIP colleagues there, uh, along with a number of partners. Um, and we're working um, on a couple of critical issues that uh, are important for creating a more stable Pakistan. And one is um, a series of dialogues between police and the community to build greater trust uh, between police and communities because in the absence of that, they keep 
falling into conflict over and over again. We also do a lot of work with community groups, youth entrepreneurs on different programs, a lot of the media based for countering the kind of um, misinformation and uh, divisive messages that have over the years really increased the, the, the competition between different ethnic groups in Pakistan. Uh, so over the last year, over the last decade, say, the, 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 the lack of trust in the fighting between different religions and different ethnic groups within Pakistan have really created greater instability in that country, um, including the rise of more extremist ideologies. And so there are a lot of people that we work with that we support that are working very hard to try to counter that by creating you know, greater pathways for understanding between different communities. You must have some incredibly talented uh, people to go into those areas and develop the trust and confidence between uh, parties uh, at, at odds with one another. Well, uh, most of our team, in fact, all of them in Pakistan are Pakistanis. And, you know, one of the things that has just kept me going for so many years is the world is filled with unbelievably dedicated, energized, smart, and talented people who really want to make a better world. Um, and so it's been an extraordinary privilege to be able to meet and work with people like that all around the world. And it is, it is about the, the importance of building peace from the bottom up. And how does uh, USIP's work in these conflict areas uh, relate to the work in DC? How does, how does that all fit together? We also do a lot of work in terms of providing policy analysis and conflict analysis that creates um, uh, some policy options and ideas for the, for the policymakers here. Um, and for example, we're very, very involved with support for the Afghan peace process. And we are working with our government, with the Afghan government, uh, but also with communities in provinces throughout Afghanistan. It's a, it's a really powerful example of all the pieces that you need to address in order for a peace process to move forward. It's a very complicated environment right now. But importantly also for it to have any hope of being sustainable, you need to bring along the various constituencies as they look at what are the critical issues to bring to that negotiating table. And there's also a, a, a very vigorous effort at public education. I mentioned uh, Ann Louise Colgan, who, who is uh, yes. the director of that program, and she's been to Tennessee uh, for the Peace Teachers Program. Uh, we were fortunate to uh, have our World Affairs Council uh, connected to that uh, great opportunity. But uh, you were here in in Nashville in 2017, as I mentioned. How does that kind of outreach um, at home connect with the uh, Institute's uh, mission? Well, we were founded in part with a mission to serve as a symbol of America's commitment to peace. And we have a beautiful building right on the National Mall, which we invite all of your members, hopefully to come up and have a chance to visit when we're all traveling again. Um, and under the leadership of Anne Louise Colgan and her team, we do that in part through these wonderful outreach programs, and as you mentioned, peace teacher programs, helping teachers uh, bring into their classrooms an understanding of what goes on around the world, uh, what is America's contribution overseas, and what are some of the core tools for um, understanding and addressing conflict. Because conflict is everywhere, um, and uh, you know ha these these are tools that can be learned. Uh, so it's it's a wonderful opportunity to be in dialogue and in touch with people all across the United States. And the partnership with World Affairs Council has been really terrific. Well, I'd, I. Uh can speak for uh, the World Affairs Councils of America in that uh, what USIP has, has done in support of our education outreach efforts has, has been incredible, hosting uh, and sponsoring uh, the Academic World Quest competition at the USIP headquarters building, which for anybody who 
has not seen it needs to uh, visit that end of Constitution Avenue. It's it's a magnificent uh, piece of architecture and and uh, is is really symbolic of uh, of the kinds of you know the the soaring uh, uh, atmosphere must must be inspiring to everybody who works there. Um, when when we uh, arranged the conversation, the main theme was uh, of what we were going to talk about was uh, the USIP mission, uh, but also the impact of COVID-19. But in the last few weeks, uh, we've all seen that uh, the United States uh, has been grappling with another set of issues uh, that uh, has, has really become a, a worldwide uh, uh, issue. And USIP as an organization um, works internationally, but uh, you issued a statement Friday night on, on peace and justice that addressed the current moment on the domestic front. Uh, why did you feel it necessary to, to weigh in on that? And uh, what's needed in terms of a peace agenda here at home at the moment? You know, we, uh, we had uh, two weeks of very intensive internal reflection and dialogue, which I'm sure every organization in the United States, every community, every family is having some variety of that. And, um, you, you know, both as citizens of this country, we felt that it was important to, to take stock of this moment, to understand it, to understand how it affected us as individuals and our own organization. And also very importantly, it, as we talk about peace and justice around the world, we talk a lot about how uh, sustained peace must rest on inclusion and equality. And when you lack inclusion, when you have communities that are fragmented or marginalized, uh, who, who don't have access to justice, who, uh, citizens who don't trust their government or their security forces are overly repressive, those are the key ingredients that can lead to violent conflict. And so it was with great soberness that we realized uh, for us to be credible in our work around the world, we needed to be uh, cognizant of what was going on here at home. Um, we are looking very hard at, are there ways in which we can further um, bring aspects of our work overseas to bear here domestically? Um, fully mindful of the many, many groups that are fully focused on this. Um, but also understanding that we have, uh, you, you know, we need to look within ourselves and we need to look within our organization to, to fully understand the weight of the last 400 years that led to the last two weeks. You know, my office on the mall um, looks right across at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and it's both a reminder of what happens when a country isn't able to resolve its conflict without violence, which is how I often think of it. And it, of course, brings forward, um, you know, the, the, the pain um, of the deep racial injustice that we're all facing now in our own country. I, I'm hopeful, though, in that, you know, the, the um, extraordinary turnout of people across this country and even around the world, but in this country, um, the very inclusive marches uh, that for the most part were peaceful uh, indicate that I think there is a readiness, a willingness, and a commitment for a different kind of conversation here in the United States. So hopefully we'll move us forward in a positive way. Well, I, I applaud uh, taking uh, the initiative to, to talk about the issues on the domestic front in addition to the work USIP does uh, internationally. It's, it's been a, a, a tough time right now with the pandemic and, and uh, the, the civil uh, uh, issues that we're facing at home, but do you see any uh, signs of, of progress over the past number of years? Uh, you know, today in our news review, we talked about last week's release of the 2020 Global Peace Index, and uh, the, the overall uh, signs were worrisome. Um, and it was kind of surprising that the United States itself uh, is in position 121 uh, out of, I think it was 163 uh, countries around the world. And Afghanistan, where, where you, you devote a lot of, uh, of energy, uh, was, uh, was dead last. So uh, we've, we've got dead, uh, you know, these challenges 
uh, but uh, where can we find sources of optimism? Well, we do have challenges right now, and I think the pandemic will um, both short term and longer term uh, really exacerbate those challenges. Um, I will say that in terms of uh, what happens, it, it, there are a lot of choice points that will determine if we're able you know, to, to, to arrest a, a possible falling back of progress, because there has been tremendous progress over the past two decades. And you know, we need to remember that in terms of lifting people out of poverty, addressing infant and uh, maternal mortality, cutting hunger in half, um, definitely more peaceful around the world. And so where we are is with all of these stresses and challenges, the rise of nationalism, authoritarianism, and the COVID pandemic, um, there, we're, we're, at, we're at a very critical moment. And it matters that we stay uh, focused on it. There's, I think, throughout the more developed economies, um, there's such pain at home right now that there could be an impulse to just pull in mm -hmm. and focus only on what's going here at home. My hope is that there will remain focused attention on how interconnected we are globally. And even at a very pragmatic level uh, on the pandemic response, if we only think about it within our own shores, we will most surely have a reoccurrence of it down the road because pandemics truly don't know boundaries and borders. Um, and we're seeing that although in the more fragile states, particularly in Africa and the Middle East, that the virus was much slower to take hold, it's now starting to roar through there uh, in ways that could be fairly profoundly destabilizing and most importantly could roll back uh, two decades of progress in a matter of months. Uh, a, a challenge in, indeed. Um, one of the uh, consequences of, of the uh, issues that we're, we've been talking about the, the past couple of weeks after uh, Mr. Floyd uh, lost his life in Minneapolis has been the, uh, uh, the impact overseas. And, and we've seen a, a lot of global response. And we talked earlier in, the, in our news review about uh, some of the, uh, the opinions uh, that were surfacing uh, think tanks and uh, newspapers and so forth. And it, it seemed, uh, I don't know if it's uh, encouraging that, that people still look to us, albeit with concern, but uh, they look to the United States for the example of, of what society should, should, should be seeking. You know, we have long held forth um, a, uh, a vision of an equitable, just society that was welcoming uh, to all uh, on an equal basis. We haven't lived up to that vision fully. Uh, and I think the last two weeks have really underscored the fact that you know, we, we have a lot of work to do here at home in terms of addressing these, these really deep-seated uh, racial injustices. But I, I do think how we handle this moment will be very, very critical in terms of being able to continue to carry that vision overseas. Um, because it is, uh, it, it is an amazing vision. It, it is a vision that um, I think over and over again has shown that in the absence of, the, of, of equality and justice and accountability, in the absence of this, you, you know, almost inevitably you, you, you move into instability and you move into conflict that becomes violent. And we're seeing that right now in, in the COVID response where actually a number of the more authoritarian states, which appear to be less fragile on the face of it, are being shaken uh, because they really can't control in the same way that they could pre-COVID. There's a lack of trust in what the leaders are saying to their citizens um, and the, the misinformation doesn't compute when people around you are dying and don't have access to a hospital. So it, it, it is a very fraught moment, but it's a moment where it is, I think, absolutely essential that the U.S. not forego a leadership ro uh, role around the, the globe. People do look to us 
um, I think we do still have an important vision to offer. And um, it, it, there are, um, we have lots of partners in the world who share that vision if we're able to maintain that alliance um, of, of like-minded partners. And, and as you've noted, there are tremendous numbers of people of goodwill around the world. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, you and, and your colleagues at USIP are, are uh, bringing them together for, for these kinds of things. One of the programs that uh, you had mentioned to me in the past that you participated in was a program with uh, youth leaders and the Dalai Lama. Um, how, how cool is that? How, how cool is that? <laughs> uh, what, tell, tell us about that. What, what was the purpose, the significance, and, and, and your personal reflection of, of that opportunity? Well, I have to say I knew I'd make the right decision to come to USIP when on day three, back in 2015, I had an invitation to meet uh, the Dalai Lama who was visiting Washington, D.C. And as we met and discussed, uh, it turns out that his vision was very aligned with our vision statement because USIP's you know, big vision statement is a world without violent conflict and his is a century without violent conflict. So it was a beautiful partnership uh, that was cooked up on that basis. And what we've done for the past five years is bring to Dharamsala where the Dalai Lama lives, uh, a selection of youth leaders from conflict affected countries. Um, about 26, 28 of these, mainly in their 20s, youth leaders who are from places like Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Nigeria, uh, Syria, you know, those kinds of places, Venezuela, Colombia. And these are all, I mean, talk about inspiring. These are youth leaders who, despite you know, the environments in which they're living and working, Many of them have gone through extraordinarily difficult circumstances. One young man was pulled off a bus by Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, managed to escape. Another young man was in the bombing of the stadium in Uganda by Al-Shabaab, and his best friend who was next to him was killed. The stories go on. But mm -hmm. all of them have chosen to work for peace in their communities. Instead of becoming angry and bitter, They've all chosen to be these extraordinary leaders for peace. And the opportunity to come together and form a network through this generation, generation change network that now has uh, youth leaders around the world uh, is to bring a group of them to come talk to the Dalai Lama because it's really a conversation of how do you maintain the inner resilience to maintain your inner compass, to do that kind of work, especially when you live and work in an environment that is all the signals are to get angry, to get violent. Um, so that I have to say that's probably one of the most extraordinary and rewarding things I've ever had the great privilege to do. Well, that's, that's terrific. We're going to turn to some uh, questions now, uh, Nancy. We have a uh, 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 bunch of a couple of these together so you can uh, work through them. From Julian, can you uh, speak uh, to some of the top down approaches USIP has taken to work on peace with foreign governments. And uh, another uh, questioner asks, uh, beyond limitations in travel, how has the pandemic impacted USIP's work overseas? Uh, are things on hold or uh, are people still working uh, on the projects that you have? Great questions. Uh, so Julian, on a top down, a really, an example that I like a lot is in Nigeria, where the herders and the farmers are increasingly uh, in violent conflict as the grazing land has disappeared, it is, we've been working with a group of uh, civil society leaders and religious leaders to identify what could possible solutions be. And they have identified ideas and policy recommendations that they have then brought to the governors who hold, just like in this country, they have a lot of of, of authority and responsibility. A number of these have been implemented, including local peacemaking, um, almost mediating structures. Uh, and some of those policy ideas also went to ECOWAS, which is the regional body that governs uh, West Africa. So it's both the kind of policies that you need a higher level government to make, in some cases a regional government, 
as well as the the, the understanding and the, and the ideas that often come from those who have directly experienced the conflict conditions, in this instance, the farmers and the herders. So you really need, you really need both the policies and the local action uh, mar married together. Um, in terms of the pandemic effect on our work, um, certainly our travel is on hold. But you know, what we found is just like we're doing right now is one of the silver linings is that now that we've all become Zoom masters, we've been able to have really interesting dialogues uh, using technology and bringing people together from a lot of different places uh, on an equal basis. Um, so bringing in the women negotiators from Afghanistan virtually to talk with negotiators from other countries, for example. So we've been able to continue our work. I think that um, you know, all of us miss the opportunity to have that more human contact. Uh, and I, there will be a point at which it will be important to replenish the social capital that you build up when you meet somebody face to face. Uh, but for the meantime, I think we are discovering some of the things that we can do with technology that practices that I think all of us will carry forward. I, I think we all have a touch of Zoom fatigue. Uh, well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're right. It does it does uh, give us uh, some advantage in our our respective missions of of reaching people that uh, we might not be able to bring into a, a lecture hall and and hear a speaker, as well as to bring speakers from another time zone who who might not be able to get here for another twenty four hour marathon. Uh, so we're we're thankful for that. <laughs> But I want to come back. Oh, we're we're anxious for you to to uh, to come through. Um, here's a question, and I better get this in. Uh, Jim Shepard, our chairman at the World Affairs Council. Uh, hello, Nancy. Welcome back to Nashville. Uh, first of all, thank you for all you have done leading a variety of organizations focused on making the world a better place. Uh, his question is, how has the recent U.S. domestic unrest impacted the ability of USIP and the U.S. to influence global events? So we, we touched on it a little bit, but, uh, you know, on, on the, the downside of the message um, that people are looking to America as that, that beacon of, of hope is, is the credibility question. And so has has this been uh, a, a moment where USIP has to has to think? Well, do we need um, uh, a damage assessment? You know, it it may be. First of all, hello, Jim. It's great to great to hear from you, and thank you once again for the wonderful hospitality a few years ago. Um, I hope you're well. Um, I, you know, I think that it's it's still a little soon to say whether our Credibility is damaged, but but what will be important is how we collectively handle this moment. Uh, and you know, the, if we collectively uh, address these issues and are able to do so peacefully and not be torn apart as a country, I think that's an extraordinary example uh, to the rest of the world. That you know, yeah, divisions, injustice, you know, racial inequality exists. It exists in a lot of countries. And how you handle it is absolutely crucial for creating a better future and a more peaceful future. We've got uh, one question from an academic WorldQuest student mom. Uh, Tracy Lehman asks, is there any way for a high school student to get involved in USIP? And I guess this goes back to the, the external uh, program for education. And, and I'll note that uh, uh, Tracy's daughter Campbell is a regular on all of our programs, and I'm sure our, our question is about to, to pop in here, but uh, she was also an academic WorldQuest student, and uh, judging from her involvement in our programs, I suspect that one day she'll be sitting in your seat at, uh, at USIP. <laughs> that would be great. Well, I invite you to go to our website and look through the public education offerings. Um, it is, again, with uh, Anne Louisa's leadership, we have we so enjoyed working with peace teachers. Uh, we have some essay contests. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously the World Quest uh, has been an, a big opportunity. It sounds like she's already taken advantage of. And um, 
inshallah, maybe she'll be in the uh, next team that goes to uh, USIP for the championship match. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, dealing with specific uh, situations. Uh, Michael uh, asks, he says he's from South Sudan and it's painful to see the continued suffering there. Uh, what are your thoughts on peace implementation in South Sudan? Another uh, trouble spot where I, I believe USIP has been in, involved for some time and and uh, you know the newest country on earth uh, is still dealing with tremendous problems. It is, and, and I worry a lot about South Sudan with COVID because uh, I just don't think that it's well, it's well equipped um, from, from the capabilities of the health system to accurate information going out. Um, I, what I am deeply impressed by is the caliber of, of, a no, of so many of the young leaders I've met from South Sudan. And one of the things that we've tried to do is support those young leaders to be a part of both the peace process itself and the monitoring of the implementation of it. Um, that is a country that the wealth of South Sudan is really in its young people. And um, they, they need a government that allows that de-emphasizes personal um, enrichment and instead really focuses on delivering for its citizens. Uh, and it's going to take young, young people to demand that and to finally rock that country out of you know, the decades of conflict. But it, it's going to, you know, it, it will still be it will still be a long road. And my, I hope Michael is able to stick with it and continue to build peace because it's an extraordinary country. It's beautiful and it's filled with just simply amazingly talented young people. Well, Michael recently joined the uh, Tennessee World Affairs Council as, as a student. So we, we look forward to seeing him at uh, more of our programs. Uh, here's a question about Kosovo uh, from Bill. He, he would like to know your thoughts on the outlook of the announced Kosovo talks uh, scheduled to take place at the White House later this month? You know, I was very, very involved with Kosovo during the Balkans, the Bosnia Wars and the Kosovo War that followed. Um, I haven't tracked it as closely. Um, I know that there's a fair amount, there, there are a lot of different opinions about um, whether uh, that broker deal uh, will be good for Kosovo or not, but I, I should hold comment because I haven't tracked it as closely as I have. Well, we we uh, oh, yes. we didn't we didn't want to be uh, drilling down so deeply that we uh, tested every uh, nook and cranny, but um, uh, I I think these these are um, interesting times for a lot of regions around the world, and we have. Um, a question about the South Asia re region. You talked about uh, Pakistan and, and the work there. This is uh, from Kudana, who uh, asks, what are the basic solutions for avoiding extremist groups who interfere in the peace process? And how do you view the factors necessary for building a peace process in the South Asia region? You talked a little bit about uh, the work in Pakistan, but uh, maybe you can uh, flesh that out a little more. Well, I, th there are a couple dimensions to that. I mean, there's specific to the Afghan peace process and the extremists, um, you know, there's the Taliban, but there's also ISIS and other extremist groups who are potentially spoilers to whatever emerges out of the inter-Afghan talks um, as they go forward. That ultimately will take regional cooperation and continued US engagement to address those issues. But, but there's a bigger uh, answer to that question that we addressed. One of the things that USIP does is at the request of Congress, we convene you know, very high level um, uh, study groups or commissions to look at quite difficult public policy uh, issues and to develop nonpartisan, bipartisan solutions to chart a new way forward. And we did that two years ago, a year and a half ago, um, on the issue of violent extremism, because you know, almost two decades after 9-11, we have kept the homeland safe, but the number of extremists around the world have increased by a factor of four, and we spent something like $7 trillion on the fight. And so the question from Congress was, is there a better way? 
to deal with violent extremism around the world. And after a long, in-depth, intensive process with a very high level group of bipartisan experts, the answer was yes. And what we need to do is to look at the conditions of a, of a fragile environment that create the possibility of violent extremist ideologies taking hold. And uh, I invite people to look that report up on our website. It's called uh, uh, Extremism in Fragile States. But there are, there are um, techni uh, techniques and approaches that now have been enshrined in the law that passed in December called the Global Fragility Act. Um, and it basically, it, it's really about looking at the whole set of tools we have in the United States, diplomatic development, as well as security, and enabling them to work together uh, to address those core issues of a state where it isn't delivering for its people or the people don't trust the state because that's the common denominator in a lot of these places where extremism flourishes. We have uh, an, a question from Campbell who I uh, suspected was going to uh, uh, get uh, a question here. She asks if there's anything America can do, America can do to help promote inter-Korean uh, peace, especially after the recent increase in tension there. Uh, that's that's a, a lofty state uh, state to state relationship. We've had the summit between uh, Washington and Pyongyang, and and not so much to show from it. Is 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 that? an area where USIP uh, applies its expertise and, and support? Well, we do have um, a, Korea, a North Korea program um, with some really, really terrific um, experts. And again, I invite people to read their analysis on the website. There's uh, one of the pieces that, or, or projects that we worked on is really identifying what would a peace regime look like? Uh, because you know we have only an uh, an armistice. We don't actually have a peace agreement following the conclusion of the Korean War. You know, back in the fifties. Um, in terms of could we could the U.S. play a role in the two Koreas? Yes, but you know we are also we are not, not an honest third party broker. You know we are deeply enmeshed uh, in with our own interests and our own. Um, issues with, with North Korea. So th that's uh, a much more complicated uh, issue. Obviously, uh, South Korea is a, is a strong ally of the United States, so we certainly want to be working in concert with them towards possible solutions, um, all of which uh, remain, I think, on the horizon at this point, as opposed to anything near term. Well, Nancy, we're, we're running uh, a little long, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, two more questions from our attendees, and then, then we'll uh, close out. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Nazad Harami, who uh, a good friend of, uh, of the World Affairs Council and of, of myself. He's the director of the Saladin Center here in Nashville. And as you, you may know, I think we discussed it on your visit. Nashville is home to the uh, largest uh, population of Kurds in, in North America. And when uh, they had the elections there after uh, uh, after Saddam was gone and everybody wound up with, with the purple finger, Nashville was a, was a polling place for uh, Kurdish voters. So uh, Nazad, thank you for uh, uh, being with us tonight. And he thanks you for coming and uh, uh, to our virtual destination here and, and the work you do at USIP. He asks, does USIP have uh, programs uh, dealing with Kurdistan, uh, Iraq, um, either dealing with Kurdistan from your headquarters or actually in, in Iraq and in Kurdistan? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's uh, another one of our longest, uh, biggest programs. And uh, we have offices both in Baghdad and Erbil. Uh, and have, we work quite closely with KRG, the Kurdistan regional government, um, on a number of issues, most notably um, in the Nineveh Plains, which is where that very rich mosaic of different ethnic groups uh, live in northern Iraq. Um, we've worked to support those minority groups' efforts to create greater rights 
uh, for themselves in the, in the Iraqi constitution. Um, and uh, also uh, facilitated dialogues between some of those ethnic groups that have longstanding grievances with each other, um, so, which I'm sure um, your questioners quite familiar with those dynamics. But um, yes, we we are very focused on that part of the world, um, and uh, great those elections were able to go forward. Uh, last question from the uh, the audience, and this this uh, is uh, in in line with the question I was I was going to ask. So we'll we'll merge these together. Julian, uh, who's co-chair of our young professionals group here at the, at the World Affairs Council, and he is soon to be off to American University uh, for graduate school in international relations, and I think he's interested in foreign service or those sorts of things in Washington. So I suspect he may be knocking on the, at the door at USIP for research or internships or, or some some relationship. I, I know he admires the work of USIP. And anyway, Julian uh, asks, um, in your work in Afghanistan, how have you been able to effectively bring women to the discussion in order to build sustained peace uh, based on inclusion? And, and my question along those lines was, um, where have you seen women's roles in peace building uh, become more significant? What uh, what lessons have been learned there and, and where can we build upon that? So many lessons and so much research that tells us that when women are more involved with the peace process, it's more likely to be sustained. Uh, the, peace is more likely to continue longer after the conclusion of a peace deal. Um, in Afghan, and, and we have a gender team that um, works exactly on this kind of research. And um, in Afghanistan, we've been very, very involved in supporting different coalitions of women to enable them to get the kind of training that uh, equips them to be uh, potentially a part of the negotiating team or a part of the support group for the, uh, the women who are at the table. And we did this wonderful event uh, last fall, bringing a group, a group of about 25 Afghan women who are very involved with the peace negotiations uh, to meet with women from Colombia who were very involved with that peace uh, negotiation, as well as from the Philippines who, uh, who, who were involved in that. And they were able to share stories about what worked, um, how to be more successful. And what we're seeing is that um, there's, it's taking too long, but there is starting to be uh, a greater cadre of women who actually have that kind of experience. Because what we're seeing is that it's, it's really quite rare still. Most peace nego negotiators are men, um, and often older men. So what, we're, you know, what we know is that when you have the right, more voices at the table, including youth and women or underrepresented groups, you're much more likely to get the kind of equitable peace deal that reflects people's needs that manage, enables you to have the longer term peace. Women are absolutely essential, as well as all the ways in which they are peace builders in their communities on an ongoing basis. Terrific. Well, thanks to everybody for uh, uh, submitting questions. Uh, I think we had a good conversation there. Um, let me uh, close with uh, one last uh, question. Uh, Nancy, as, as you prepare to move on from the U.S. Institute of Peace at the end of this summer and uh, take uh, the reins at the Packard Foundation in California and San Francisco, what do you think your legacy of uh, your five years at USIP will be? What are the big things you've, you've focused on and achieved and what will be the big priorities for your successor? Um, Easy question there. Yeah, I know, in, in a minute or less. You know, I, I would break it down into one, I think that we've really deepened our, uh, our work on a theory of change that talks about what is a sustained peace, uh, that inclusive approach to uh, enabling top-down, bottom-up peace to be built. Um, uh, and I hope that I've been able to contribute to assembling and supporting a truly talented team that who I have learned enormous amounts from. Um, it's been a real honor and pleasure to serve um, an extraordinary 
group of people uh, over these last five years. And, um, you know, I hope that the priority of a successor will be in part to maintain that. Um, it, U.S. Institute of Peace is uh, truly a unique institution in Washington and an enduring part of a vision that really started with our founders and a place and a way to continue to try to realize that vision. Well, um, big hat tip to you and your colleagues and, and I am thankful that uh, you came to Nashville and I got to, to know you and become a friend and, and wish you the very best in, in your future endeavors. And again, thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, for your service uh, around the world in places where most Americans probably would not want to spend very much time. Um, Nancy, uh, thanks again, and thanks to your staff for helping uh, facilitate this, and uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, to our uh, attendees, uh, thanks for uh, being with us tonight. Uh, please take a look at our website, tnwac.org, for future uh, pod or webinars and podcasts, and uh, consider becoming a member. That's how we uh, pay the light bill. Uh, so that's, uh, that's it for tonight. Again, thanks to Nancy Lindborg, President of the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, for being with us tonight. And uh, everyone, uh, be safe out there. Thank you, Pat. And thank you to the Tennessee World Affairs Council. You all do amazing work. Thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you in Music City again. <laughs>